You're listening to the AfterBuzz TV Network. Now the largest new media platform on the web and your number one source for after-show entertainment. Very good, Gene. From the AfterBuzz Studios in Los Angeles, California, presented by Maria Menunos and Bing.com, and streaming live thanks to Akamai Technologies, it's AfterBuzz TV's Californication After Show. We'll break down tonight's episode and get you all the latest news and gossip. If you'd like to buzz in on tonight's show, you can buzz us at 424-256-1729. That's 424 424- 256-1729. And now, another post-game wrap-up show for your favorite TV show. It's AfterBuzz TV's Californication After Show. God, I missed that music. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Bing is for doing, and we're here doing the first episode of season six, which means it's episode one. Episode one. The Unforgiven. Yeah. I am your last season's host, Phil Svitek. Joined alongside this season, you may know her from other after shows here at AfterBuzz TV, such as Bachelor, yeah. Bachelor Pat, yeah. Bachelorette, ah. Sons of Anarchy, so good. Rizzoli and Isles, among others. I'm probably forgetting like 40 of them. <laughs> but I have Chris Lee, the only Kennedy. Thank you very much. What an intro. That's right. I timed that perfectly. It was perfectly. How are you this evening? I am fantastic now that I got my double D in. David Duchovny? Yeah. Oh, I'm just gonna, all right. <laughs> anyway. Uh, welcome, everybody. It's good to be back. Um, it's, it's, uh, we'll find our groove, but I think uh, I'm excited for I'm dubbing this. See, Shakespeare's story ended of Romeo and Juliet. Mm-hmm. This story continues. Yes, it does. But Hank wishes he was dead anyway. Um, so, which kind of is, is basically our first topic is the aftermath of Carrie. And, um, you know, uh, as, as the opening scene opened up, uh, you said, oh, this is a flashback. It's interesting how they, Karen and Hank met. And I said, mm-hmm. no, it's a dream. And we were both kind of right in our own way. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, why you said you liked them meeting at a bar. Why? I, I think it's the bartender in me. But okay. I just thought it was really cute and sweet. And, I mean, I've never gone home with somebody from the bar, so I guess maybe not. But I just – it was just a very normal average meeting for me. And to see how they've progressed as a couple and not progressed in the same way, it was just kind of a – we've never seen how they met. And so I kind of liked seeing that very normal and how she kind of gave him shit. Yeah. Um, what I liked was the uh, that, that Hank couldn't – take a no for an answer and uh you know the whole notion of you know who was your one right that kept Mm -hmm. being brought up and obviously carrie um her friend says you know despite everything she believed you were the one and and so how far we will go despite everything to to find the one and and later on you know uh karen says i have a boyfriend and hank says we can overcome such obstacles (laughs) um so it's gonna be interesting i think i don't know i could be wrong but i think we're gonna explore the notion of who is the one? Is there a one? Well, I think as a viewer of Californication, it's been clear to me since the beginning that they have found the one for each other. They just have a really hard time of getting that together. So what does it take? I mean, uh, you know, uh, not to cut too far ahead, but, um, you know, because we'll, we'll certainly talk about it in a different dynamic. But with Atticus, he says, you know, all the world's problem, problems come face to face with love. Mm-hmm. And they've come face to face with everything, and yet they're in love but not together. But at the end of the day, no matter where they are or who they're with, their their priority is always each other. Yeah. No matter what relationship they're in. And I feel like one of my favorite things about the show is that I love Hank Moody. There's some parts of me that feels like I could be Hank Moody, and then there's some parts of me, there's something that's very romantic about his part and even as sleazy as it gets to see that that separation of love and sex for him which is very obvious and has been throughout the seasons they are they're always end up back and they're always each other's number one priority no matter what 
I, I would agree, but um, here's here's where it gets complicated is because, uh, you know, basically Karen said, like, let's be together in tonight's yeah. episode. And he rejected her to an extent, uh, you know, which he did a, a sort of a similar thing in season two where, you know, she was like, hey, let's basically have sex. And he was like, he passed up sex. And he's like, are you serious? And he did that last season as well on yeah. the beach. Yeah. So, uh so I don't, I don't know how I'm supposed to take that from Hank, where, uh, because obviously he's dealing with the whole notion of Carrie basically, you know, suicide and all that, and he doesn't know how to go on, and obviously the obvious choice would be to, to forget about it and move on with Karen, but he's not. Well, I think this is the first time, I mean, we've seen Hank sleep with millions of women, right? Yes. But this is the first time that what he's done has had such a big outcome. It's it, He's always held accountable in some way by Karen and by other people, but never to the extent of someone lost their life. And granted, you don't know when you meet somebody that you're going to get crazy. That comes in time. And she was clearly crazy and had other things going on. But he's never had anything like this, any kind of repercussion to his actions that were that he felt, and this is the first time he's felt that. So I don't think that he said no to Karen because he doesn't love her, doesn't believe they're meant for each other. I think that he's just so scared and hurt right now because he didn't realize that his actions had that effect on other people. Yeah, and, and the tough part is too, um, you know, with Hank, you know, he never cared, and so he never was looking for that, you know right. what I mean? And um, and so had he kind of, in some sense, you know, been aware of that, you know what, my, my actions do have consequences. And he, he's always aware of it, but it, as in his suicide, he wrote, you know, um, a lot of thought, no action. Mm -hmm. You know, um, he kind of glossed that and, he, you know, never did he think even because I think some guys would pick up on the fact that she is crazy. You know, Carrie and, you know, they would have broken it. You, you know, they would have severed ties in a gentler way. He didn't give a crap. Well, I feel like the whole Carrie thing, he was honest with her. And and maybe he wasn't honest with her right at the get-go. But I feel like with Hank, and I feel like as a woman, when you meet a guy like that, yeah, of course, at the beginning, you think you're going to change him. But at the end of the day, you know what kind of guy he is. And you know who he is. And you know that he just wants sex, no strings attached. He's not a relationship kind of guy. And he told her that. And we saw that. They were in the restaurant. And she, he said it to her. He's like, you're really great, but it's just sex. And he said it to her more than one occasion. You know, and I, I feel like... She... But with Hank, everything, nothing can be taken at face value. And especially, he, he's a writer, so he has a way, uh, naturally, poetically, speaking about such ideas. Smooth talker. Very smooth yeah. talker. And uh, he himself doesn't know how to always see the situation for what it is. I mean, uh, in the bar with the guy trying to propose, that's, that, that's just, a, you know, that's the ultimate example. He, he misinterpreted that whole situation. Well, I thought it was going there as well. So maybe I guess I'm a little bit more like Hank than I'd like to admit. Because I, I heard the same thing that Hank did. I heard him saying, well, I like you, but he said the but. And so I feel like Hank related to that and knew that feeling and went off and ruined a proposal. But who gets proposed to at a bar? It, who knows? Maybe he had some play. <laughs> you know, I mean, maybe he had like a plan or something like that. You know, you, you, you don't know ultimately, but um, Moody ruined it. But Moody ruined it because he inserted himself and, and he misinterpreted the yeah. situation. And I think as a writer, he does that with a lot of things because he embellishes everything, per se, because he's a writer and that's what he does. He tells stories and he makes stories. And so I feel like he doesn't have that separation of work and self sometimes. Yeah. And uh, I think, you know, as he was saying, uh, everything kind of revolves around him. This, uh, you know, kind of interpreting what he said to Runkle, you know, I'm doing some research for a novel. Research phase. And, you know, that's I get, that's how he does things. You yeah, know, he absolutely. Does, he, he inserts himself into the situation of that, and, and if it's not life lived, then it's not life told within the page. Right. Um, which is why he hated a crazy little thing called love, mm -hmm. because it wasn't, it wasn't his experience. It got too fluffed up and right. romanticized, and even though it was a successful movie, right? It was very successful. Yeah. And they, right then they make like Tom, the the quote fake Tom Cruise and the fake Katie Holmes as the leads. I feel like yeah. Yeah, and they just put Tom and Kate. Yeah. Um, funny joke. But um, so speaking of that, let's let's kind of talk about that. Um, right, this this kind of going to be a through line for the season. It the, sounds the, like it. Yeah. The writing of this this book. This musical. Rock. What is it? Rock opera. Rock opera. Yeah. I don't know. Why, you don't like, um, what's the uh, uh, Rocky Picture Horror Show? I love Rocky Horror Picture Show. 
<laughs> that, that's what it, Rocky Horror Picture Show. Okay, you twisted the words. It's totally fine. I'm dyslexic, so I totally got it. Um, but Rocky Horror Picture Show, I love. But did I see, like, Rock of Ages? No. Yeah, but that's not a rock, you know, that's not a musical, or is it? I feel like it was, yeah, it was, they were trying to make that more current, and I just, I, I don't know, I mean, I guess obviously the book's not real, so we haven't read it, and so we don't know the story, but I don't know, he wasn't really happy about uh, his book becoming a musical either. Well, he's not happy with life. I mean, what sucks is, uh, again, he, all of Hank's work is so depressing, and that's dark, very dark, very dark, mm -hmm. and any sort of other interpretation and again this rock opera could be the saddest most depressing thing in the world but it's a it's somebody else's interpretation of his right. work he doesn't like that i i don't think many people do i mean you have to look at it healthy you have to like i mean if um you have to look at it from a side of okay if if, if you create something and, and someone doesn't exactly see it 100 percent but they if they understand that it's it's a depressing book but they find you know the the, the beauty and whatever you've written but in, interpreted in a different way then you have to accept that true i mean think of all the movie think of all the actual good books that have been adapted to good movies not talking about twilight here Chris. <laughs> you know i'm always it's it's tough because I'm, I'm not always a fan of the movies after I've read the book. If I see the movie first and then read the book, I understand it better. But as somebody who enjoys to read, I don't always love the movie adaptation. So I guess I understand and respect that I don't want my book to become a musical. But I also see the same side that I think what we've gathered as viewers with uh, – Hank's writing is that it's probably pretty similar to what we see and he's very dark but very romantic and seductive at the same time so I guess I could see how Here's it would be irony. really successful uh, Bukowski you would think that he would hate a movie made about his work right Barfly he he actually wrote wrote the script and uh, he kind of liked the movie to an extent see so I mean it can I, happen I, but um I'm kind of stretching that because if you read Bukowski's book, Hollywood, he shits on Hollywood a lot. <laughs> so I don't, I don't know if I'm making that strong an argument. Yeah. But I, I, I think that that's the, the struggle that we'll, we'll see outside of um, obviously him dealing with now being a drunk mess. But we'll, I think that's part of the struggle that we're see, we'll see throughout the season is the adaptation of this and will it go anywhere. And obviously we see that it's going to go somewhere because – they have Marilyn Manson coming in as guests and all these people. So I think we'll see that and that struggle, but I think that will be a constant of him not really wanting it to happen. And I think um, I think there's a side to, to Hank where by redoing his work in a different way, he's revisiting the stuff that pains him. Yeah, of course. You know what I mean? And he, he feels like he wants to progress. And by doing that, he's never going to be able to progress, even though even though if he thinks he's progressing, he's writing books like fucking and punching. He's right. never really progressing if he really thought about it. Right. Um, but I think I think there's a side to that where he doesn't want to revisit that stuff. Of course, not right now as well. You know what I mean? He's obviously in a really bad place. And I mean, we've always seen him drinking and doing drugs and having sex, but I don't think we've ever seen him like this where his whole family's now stepping in. As, as they said, you know, we, we want the good old fu the functional alcoholic we you know used mm -hmm. to love. Now you're just disgusting. Yeah, I mean, they, they ha he hasn't showered in days. He's drinking his own urine. I mean, he's he, it's he, kind of a low. It is very low. And, and, and if you always look at, like, right, he's the carefree spirit, but mm -hmm. notice the way he dresses. He always cares about his look. Like, oh, he yeah. always looks sharp, you know? And, and when it looks grungy, it's grungy on purpose. This is just, yeah, you're disgusting he's dude. a mess he's gross yeah um let's talk about becca um you know uh she's really matured she's i've enjoyed watching her grow up and and throughout the season she's not only become a better actress but she's just grown up in front of us and become she is kind of a little hank and a little karen put together and i like that yeah no she exactly is and uh i think i'm you know, this is the man in me talking, but I, I see the Karen side coming out more now. Yeah, yeah. It's just nice to see physically. <laughs> she does. She's. I mean, she's turned into, like, a beautiful young lady. And, you know, it's 
it's interesting to see her part in all of this now because now she's not a child anymore. So now she's kind of stepping up and in, in with a father that whether a functional alcoholic or whether he's in the position that he's in now, she's kind of having to take the parenting role a little bit with him. And so it's interesting to see that change because she's been the only one that's really changed throughout the, the seasons where we've seen her kind of differ in every single way. And we haven't seen that with anyone else. And so I've liked seeing her grow up. Yeah, and, and as she says to, to Hank, you know, just because I'm older it doesn't mean I don't need a father figure. And I, I, I interpret it as, ironically, like, you've never had a father figure. You need a lot of father catching up. Like, Hank, you've got to get on that. Yeah, but I, I think, too, as he's always been there and constant and whether he's been functional or dysfunctional within their relationships, he's always at least been there. But I don't think that he, because he's in such a bad place and he said it tonight, you know, all he does is mess up the both of their lives and he's, they're better off without him. They still need him, especially Becca. And I mean, as a, as a girl myself, like you always want your dad, you know what I mean? No matter what. So I think that that was a great part of tonight's episode. Well, uh, I mean, if you really think, uh, well, I'd love to get your interpretation on this, but does she need him more than ever now because she wants to be a writer, which is the ultimate, oh, my God, for Hank? I can't even believe that they put that in this year. I'm, I'm actually really surprised. I didn't think that she would go the writing route. I didn't know that that, you know, I didn't think that that would be her decision, seeing how it's kind of Hank uses his family and his life as his muses this is stories and where they come from so to see something so dysfunctional and then to want to be that was almost hard to swallow a little bit but it'll be interesting to see how she changes in that way i mean she was always artistic she had mm -hmm. she had you know the guitar and she had the band and stuff like that but this is yeah she says i am my my father's, father's daughter. daughter yeah oh my goodness that, that i is, love that, that is a loaded Oh, my goodness. It's true, though. I mean, I think it, if I look at my parents, I'm my father's daughter. So I completely relate to her and understand where she's coming from and what she's saying. And she'll go two ways. She'll either 100% become her father in every way, shape, and form, the addictions and all of it, or she'll take the bits and pieces that she needs and forget the rest of it, which would make her even more successful than him. But, I mean, she's she's been in the um, in the past... She's, she said to Hank, you know, how, how can I believe in anything in love if, if you're the example that's, that's mm -hmm. out there, right, that's closest to me? And so I don't know. I don't think she has the right tools to go beyond this, you know. Uh, mu music was, you know, was a way better choice. Yeah. You know, <laughs> ironically. But look at the first man, the first guy that we see Becca really have an uh, withstanding relationship with is exactly like her Hang father. Hank 2.0. And, and it's, it's true. I, I think a lot of girls date people that are like their parents, you know what I mean? And, and she literally went with the mold of Hank. I mean, he was, he used to call himself the Hank, better Hank, you know, and he's not. He was a jerk. But, I mean, well, that's Hank, who she ended up with. Hank was a jerk. But Hank's different. Hank is a little bit different. Hank's different. There's, and I, it's so funny. I was trying to explain to someone today about the show and why I loved it so much. And for somebody that doesn't watch Californication, you hear, well, it's about drugs and sex and love, but he sleeps with everyone and you try to make it better. And it's, it, but it's the, rom it's, he's romantic. There's something about even as, the horrible things he does that still makes him this romantic guy that just wants his love. He's just really afraid of it. Yeah. And he, you know, he doesn't know how to express it. And no. he's, he's always been sort of punishing himself, mm -hmm. um, you know, now more than ever. Yeah. And he's never really known what he's punishing. Well, he's always kind of known what he's punishing himself for, but he never took it to the extreme of, of what, he he needed to necessarily to get Karen back and all that. Like ironically, he he doesn't need to punish himself. Right. If he just did the things that he was supposed to, all of this could have obviously been avoided. But he's not. I like not Hank. Right, and I liked last season how they showed that conversation of when they decided to move to LA and when they decided to make the move and how they were going to do it and that LA wasn't going to ruin them. And that's another thing that I really like about the series is that it's there's a lot of that that happens here in LA and it it's true LA does kind of break people up and turn you into 
something different sometimes. So I really enjoy watching that, and I liked that they showed that last season of their struggles of making the decision, how it wasn't going to break them, and how it ultimately did. And you know, it, it's an interesting point that you brought up, and I think I think it's California, LA, obviously in particular. But it's I think the industry. But I think anything, uh, you know, any sort of there's a term, right? Every time you leave, you come back a different person, mm -hmm. no matter where it is, right? Let's say you even take a vacation to Cabo. I gotta lose like, a layer. It's getting warm. Sorry. No worries. <laughs> Viewers like that. If gotta lose a layer. It. Getting a little hot. Sorry. Um, you know, but but Hank, you know, he was in um, New York for three years, mm -hmm. so. You know, he changed in California, but then going back to New York, he changed there. And then coming back to L.A., you know, he he, he was a mold of, of all those things. So. Right. Um, so ironically, Hank is evolving, but not in the ways he should. Well, it's so funny. I, and I know that we'll talk about this later on in, in our, our news stuff, but... The, one of my fake uh, last season was not my favorite, but one of my favorite parts of last season was that we saw Hank being responsible almost all the time. We saw him making the responsible decisions, whether we thought they were right or not, like in the case of sticking up for his ex-wife's new husband who's cheating on her, maybe he should have just told her, but he was everything that he did, he had the best interest of other people, and he hasn't always done that. Usually it's just all himself because God forbid he actually feels and cares. Yeah. And last season we saw him being an adult and actually making smart decisions with his daughter and with Karen and with his friends, and then all of a sudden, he tries. He almost gets killed, and now he's a drunk mess. That's and I right. want, I want the responsible Hank back. Well, you know, he's uh, to go back to Becca. He's trying to be responsible where uh, he is. she she needs to go to college, and I don't know. But she won't. She won't. She She's won't his know. daughter. She will drop out of college, and she will try to be a writer. Let's talk about the horrible intervention. <laughs> That was the worst intervention. I love that during their intervention, within it was like two minutes in, and it became about everybody else instantly. Yeah, and uh, and it just goes to it. What, what's nice is that works in multitude of things because again, it's a funny scene. Mm -hmm. So a you have Great that. Scene. B it just kind of reminds you of everyone else's problems, so it sets up the conflicts for what we will see. Obviously mm -hmm. with Marcy, you know she wants to have Stu. Well, she wants a nice house. She wants the house. She wants the shiny house in the hills. Which is, Let's get you know, it straight. And, uh, and so, you know, so, and that's going to be the dysfunctional relationship if she goes back, because obviously we know what Stu did. And, and uh, Karen's not all about that. Obviously, the problem of, uh, we talked about Becca. Runkle's just out of his mind. He's all just the a time. mess. Um, but it's it's funny how later on he brought up, I took a, you know, it's, Knew it that had coming. to come out. It, and I think that we'll see that come out several times with him. I think that he'll pull that card often. Um, but it, it's, I love Marcy. She's one of my favorite characters on television. I think that she's hysterical and her, her mouth is fantastic. Like the words that come out of her, the writing for her is brilliant. Like I love it. Yeah. Um, so all in all, a good episode. I mean, uh, I love the music. Um, we got John Lennon, um, instant karma at the end. Yeah. I thought it was very, very appropriate, mm -hmm. you know, um, because we went from that flashback scene or slash dream sequence yeah. to, um, to him in the rehab center, you know, and in his instant karma. It's fun. What, what, how do you interpret him saying like, uh, cause Karen invites him up, mm -hmm. you know, but he says, I won't sleep with you, you know? I mean, what is, what is that? the perfect setup. He's just the perfect, smooth-talking guy that every girl ends up sleeping with because you're a sucker These for what These lines they say. never work for me. You're using them wrong, then, man. Damn it. Maybe anyway. you need to get that double deep. It's this. Maybe it's a swagger. I don't know what it is. Like I, and I, I've tried. I literally was having this conversation today. There's just something about him that's just you're drawn to it. Phil, and I think you need like. 10 seasons on an amazing show like X-Files before you can use that swagger. No, it has go. nothing to do with X-Files. It totally does. Totally disagree. His characters are so different in both shows. Do you, I'm talking about just David Duchovny in general. I mean, do you know how many times he's probably pulled a Hank Moody in real life just from X-Files? Oh, well, I'm he, sure. He does have sex addiction. He does. We know that. Hey, buddy. <laughs> Sorry, bring your dog to work, Dave viewers, if you see the dog back uh, and forth. Um, but... You know, again, all in all, very excited for the season. Uh, you know, we'll we'll have a lot more to discuss as things kind of develop. This was yeah. just kind of an introduction, obviously. Um, why don't we do news and gossip? Let's go. After Buzz TV News. Do I have to read this or you? We didn't really discuss this. 
Uh, I mean, you can read it. Uh, why? I'll do always, next week. I read like a fourth grader. All right. <laughs> All right. Maggie Grace's major arc on the uh, this season of Californication will remain just that. Showtime had scrapped plans to potentially spin off Grace's character Faith into her own series. Uh, Showtime had the option to do um, so as Gracie's deal had a regular option behind it. Faith is a former Catholic schoolgirl turned groupie who has been on the road with various bands for years and is considered a muse to elite artists. Ooh, that's actually... Ooh. What's that? Let me remind, my, remind very, me of that in predictions. Very tiny dancer. Though she has a fondness for sex, drugs, and rock and roll, <laughs> she remains quite religious. She meets and becomes friends with Hank, and eventually that friendship blossoms into more. Surprise! That's I love Maggie. I loved her in Taken. I loved her in Taken 2. I'm so excited to see her in a role like this. Um, obviously, it's going to be a really big role for her if Showtime was even considering a spinoff. So I can't wait to see what she does. Yeah, that's, I, that's almost unheard of. Yeah. You know, you kind of, I mean, you have the Cleveland show from the family. Family Guy, yeah. <laughs> which it doesn't compare to Family Guy. No, that's the only example I can think of of spinoffs. No, I mean, my that name happens is Cleveland in, Brown. I was like, what is happening right now? That's it happens all the, the time in reality television, but I've never seen it happen in something like this. Yeah. Um, but I mean, I think she's an amazing actress, and I can't wait to see her this season. And I mean, we knew they they were gonna sleep together, so. Yeah. Well, that's what happens. Um, also, Rolling Stone did an amazing um, interview with, yeah. with Duchovny. And uh, they talked about the new season and stuff like that. And uh, one of the things that Duchovny said, even though with um, RZA, Hank was kind of in the rock and roll. Well, this is talking about the storyline, right? We, we yeah. gave away the rock opera, and obviously that's where it's going. So in speaking of that, uh, Duchovny said, even though with RZA, Hank was kind of in the rap world, he was kind of an interpreter. Yes. Um, but this is kind of a more rock and roll year, and uh, that's where Hank lives. One of the fun things for me is I started to teach myself guitar last year, and Tom Capinos, the, uh, the showrunner of the show, uh, knows that I was learning, so he threaded through the year little bits where Hank had to play guitar, so I had to keep betting, getting better and taking more lessons. Love that. So we'll see We'll see um, David Duchovny play some guitar. Yeah, that was a really great article, too, and it talked about his relationship with Becca both on and off screen, which I thought was really interesting because now he has to treat her differently as an actress because she's getting older, and also because she's now this different person in the cast, he has to treat her differently when he's acting with her. And I liked that as well. It was. A, it was I thought it was a great article all around, and I just... Double D, back. Very Double excited. D. We got to get a better, better nickname. I mean, that's what they call him, Double D. Is that Hank Moody, they... yeah, Double D. All right. Come on, man. Well, that is Get with all... the program. I call it something else Double D, but all right. <laughs> um, that's all the news and gossip we have for January 13th, 2013. Yes. So without further ado, let's get into predictions. Mm. And now, you're after Buzz TV predictions. <laughs> um, so what do you predict? Um, I predict there'll be a lot of sex. A lot of drugs and a lot of alcohol this season. But the sex is always meaningful. No, it's not. And that's why I love Me it. No, meaningful in, meaningful in, in terms of... In the story. Of, yeah, in yeah. terms of the story. Exactly. I mean, Hank slept with, uh, you know, Becca's boyfriend's mom. And, you know, I mean, it's, there's always crossing paths. Yeah, I, you know, but his sex is just sex, unless it's with Karen. That is true. There's never feelings behind it. There's never emotion. To him, it's just like having a cup of coffee, smoking that's, a that, cigarette. That's why the title, Fucking and Punching, that's that's a great title because that's it's all it is. Brilliant. It was just fucking and punching. That's all it was. I mean, and it, the, there's, no, there's no emotion in his life other than with his family and his writing. That's it. That's the only emotion that's there. And I, I think that's why you're drawn to him and you're drawn to the story because you want, you, you want to root for Hank and Karen every season like you do you want to see them together and i, I almost want to see marcy i want to see the runkles back i think oh behave i do that, that that would be interesting i would love to see them back together i mean they're clearly still friends i mean they've always had a tumultuous relationship but i'd love to see them back together yeah i mean it, the good news runkles does genuinely care about marcy Mar marcy's just crazy but that's just marcy yeah, they're both hot messes. I mean, she's crazy, but she's always been crazy. She's never changed. He's gotten crazier because of her leaving, you know? So it'll be interesting to see where he ends up this season as well. Yeah. 
Um, and of course, we can accept, expect a lot more comedy. It's something that we kind of tend to overlook. I mean, uh, him, uh, Hank going into the wrong house with the kid. Oh that, my God. At first I was like, oh my God, that's Marcy's son. He got so big. Wow, it's been a long time. And then no. <laughs> it wasn't even the right house. No. Um, so all, all very funny things. Runkle, of course, uh, very great comedic relief overall. Yeah. Getting punched in the nose, getting punched again. And, you know, the Hank puking on the coke. That was great. That's the only successful relationship Hank has is with Runkle. Runkle. But ironically, well, he, he can push Runkle away. And he did. He did. Very much. Yeah. And, and so, you know, don't push Runkle too much. Runkle, mm -mm. Runkle does have a breaking point. Um, anyways, we will be back next week. Yes, um, we will. Until then, you can follow Chrisley at? At Chrisley. On Twitter, of on course. On Twitter. Instagram? Yeah. Same thing, Chrisley. There you go. Um, you can follow us here at AfterBuzz TV. So, on behalf of Chrisley and myself, we want to thank you for listening. Rate and comment on iTunes. I forgot to tell you that, but it's super important. Yes. So, please do that. We really, really appreciate it. So, until that, we'll see you next week. From Bing.com, executive producers Maria Menounos, Kevin Undergaro, Phil Svitek, oh. and the entire AfterBuzz TV staff, we would like to thank you for listening to the AfterBuzz TV network. To watch or listen to other after shows and post comments or questions, be sure to visit AfterBuzzTV.com. I'm Sir Richard Wentworth, and this has been a presentation of AfterBuzz TV. Oh, it was very Shakespeare now how at the beginning they had they took the drugs. <laughs> Chrisley wanted me to say that. It this was. makes no sense. Romeo and Juliet. Yeah, but buzz, buzz, buzz you later. You later. I'll explain <laughs> next week. The views expressed herein are those of the hosts only and do not necessarily reflect the views of AfterBuzz TV or its owners or principal.